always great to have, have Ken and, and Connie Temple with us. They are, are great people. They've served since 1992, is that right? Since, but, but with us, we've, we, he's been ministering to the Muslims since 82, but he's telling me he, we have been supporting him, them since 1992. And he's been, they've been faithful to minister to the Muslim uh, people. Uh, we know there's a great need there. Today they reported on their recent trip to Turkey and some places. And I'll let him share any that he would like to share. But would you welcome Ken and Connie back to Mountain View Church today? So. Bless you, bro. Thank you, man. All right, turn to the book of Hebrews, if you have your Bible. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Thank you so much for all these years of your prayers and financial support. Uh, we have been missionaries to Muslim peoples. Um, in 1983, I started reaching out to Muslims that live here in the United States. And then later... Uh, you guys have been a part of our team supporting us since 92 and right before we left for the field in January of 93. And uh, the Lord in His sovereignty is causing Muslims to turn away from Islam. God in His sovereignty is actually shaking the Muslim world Many Muslims are disillusioned with the harshness of Islam. There are those that are getting more fanatical and more uh, committed to the original Islam. Like you see in the news, uh, the government of Iran is very committed to original Islam, but the people of Iran, I should say the educated, the middle class and the upper class in the big cities, are turning away from Islam as never before. And they're fleeing from Iran, and there are many refugees in other countries. Uh, and then some Arabs are also turning away from Islam. Uh, the Iranians are Persians. They have their own language. The Arabs, uh, there's probably five major Arabic groups and they, 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 they're different from each other. Moroccan Arabic is a lot different than Egyptian, which is different than Gulf Arabic or Saudi Arabia, which is different than Iraqi Arabic, and they've told me that when I ministered to them too. The Turks have their own language. Uh, it's not Arabic, although there is a lot of Arabic inside of Turkish and inside of Farsi or Persian, the language of Iran and about half of Afghanistan speaks Persian or Farsi. They call it Dari from Dariush, Darius, that we read about in the Bible in Zechariah, Haggai, Ezra, Nehemiah, Dariush. Um, and then there's the Kurds in the Middle East. Those are the four major ethnic ling linguistic groups, Arabic speakers, Persians, Turks and Kurds, and they all have their own language, even though they're all Muslims. And most of our experience has been with a couple of these groups, especially one of these. <laughs> and they are turning away from Islam. And so we have been able to teach young Christians, young believers, Many of them named Muhammad or Ali or Mehdi or Abbas or Abdul Aziz, uh, very Muslim names who are now believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we thank you. You get to minister to Muslims and former Muslims who are now Christians because of your prayers and giving for us. And so we do appreciate that greatly. I chose uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4 because... I've been teaching a group uh, of these former Muslims who are now Christians, two different groups by Zoom for the past year. Uh, they asked me, I've taught them hermeneutics. That means how to interpret the Bible properly in context, reading 
not just taking the verse out of context and making your own uh, thing that you want, uh, but reading the verses, especially looking at the verses before and after, and interpreting it properly in the context of uh, when it was written. I taught them Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, church history, which was a big challenge. And uh, my colleague, his name is Muhammad, but he's a Christian. He's, his pastor was executed by one of these uh, countries, one of the governments, back in 1989. And he fled, and we've been working together since 2005. Uh, he, he teaches uh, like Christian growth classes and other classes. And we have other Iranian brothers, like the brother that uh, he and I together for 12 years here in Atlanta were the two elders of an Iranian ethnic church here in Atlanta, the Persian Community Church. And we usually get him to teach pastoral counseling and uh, pastoral ministry because he's just a great guy. And so it's been a great privilege to uh, meet uh, all these different um, former Muslims. And uh, so after I, we taught them all these different courses for several years, uh, they asked me to teach the book of Hebrews. So the book of Hebrews has been in my mind and heart a lot, and I had to, I had to really study hard and put it all into Farsi. In fact, I'm at the end of chapter 12, so all I have is a little bit more in chapter 12 and chapter 13 to go in Farsi. So that's why I chose Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 4, as an example uh, of what we've been teaching these former Muslims. Uh, let's uh, read the word. Uh, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you have spoken. You have spoken clearly. And illumine our hearts, Lord. For those that are believers, use this word today to encourage them in holiness and worship and perseverance. And if there's anyone who doesn't know you yet, Lord, we ask for your spirit to cause uh, new birth, and you would draw them in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I see here five elements of this passage, five elements, five points. Number one, God has spoken, verses one and two. He says, God spoke in the past, and then he says, in these last days he has spoken in his son, or through his son. That's number one. God has spoken. Whenever we're struggling, you know, a lot of times we ask, how come God doesn't speak anymore like he did to Abraham and Moses and Noah and the prophets? We forget he has spoken. And he has spoken clearly. And just as we sang about that's why we worship him, that's why we bow down, because of what Christ has done, and this passage is hinting at the incarnation, his suffering, and his final atonement. He's the final sacrifice. So uh, God has spoken. God has spoken in the Old Testament, and God has spoken through his Son, which later becomes the New Testament from this passage. Whatever The New Testament is whatever the apostles were inspired to write about the Son. Um, element number two, the Son is the final revelation in these last days. Verse two, he has spoken to us in his Son. It actually says by a Son. 
That is, the method of God speaking was his son, his person, who the son is. When we sang about the name of God, in the Bible, the name of God means everything that he is. It's not just being able to say verbally uh, Yahweh or Jehovah or Jesus or the Christ. It's not verbal uh, sounds in the air. It's not phonetic sounds when he's saying that. When the Bible says the name of God, he's talking about all that he is, all the doctrine of who God is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son is the final revelation, element two. Element three, the Son is the final sacrifice, verse three, when he had made purification of sins. And this will be fleshed out a lot more in chapters seven, eight, nine, and 10 in the book of Hebrews, which is really the, one of the main um, discussions of the book of Hebrews is that Christ is the final sacrifice, the final, the final atonement, once for all, once for all time. No more sacrifices. Uh, as I was sharing, well, I'll go into that later maybe. Uh, and then the son, uh, part of that final sacrifice, the finality of it, the power of it, is that Jesus rose from the dead. His resurrection proved that his atonement was powerful and effective and his resurrection proved that everything Jesus said was true. Everything he taught and said about himself was true. And his ascension and his session or his seating at the right hand of the power of God. Uh, he's talking about all of those things. His death, his atoning death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his session at the right hand of God are all together uh, in the work of redemption. The Son is the final sacrifice. The fourth element of this passage, the Son is fully God. He's also fully human, which he hints at here, uh, but he's going to emphasize the deity of Christ. It focuses on the deity of Christ in verses 2 and 3, and we'll go over that in a minute. And then the fifth element is the son has become better than the angels. Now, he doesn't mean the son was not before, uh, because in verse 2, he says, uh, in these last days he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. So what he's saying is, look at chapter 2, verse uh, 9. This is the key to understanding he has become better than the angels uh, in verse 4. In chapter 2, verse 9, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So chapter 2, verse 9 is key to understand what he means. He's talking about the eternal Son of God who also created all things. He created the world. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit created the world and existed from all eternity past. And when he says he has become greater than the angels, he's talking about his incarnation, that he humbled himself. He became a human being. He was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived uh, by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He was persecuted by the people, uh, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the scribes, the uh, elders of the nation of Israel. They conspired together with Herod and with Pontius Pilate to crucify Jesus. They crucified him. He suffered injustice. He suffered the most injustice done to any person in all of history. And yet, he, the, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, voluntarily came to become a human and lived out his life and suffered for that and overcame death. Died. He, he willingly took on the wrath of God against sin. 
He willingly took the punishment, the justice of God, the wrath of God against sin, even though he was totally innocent and pure and without sin, he took our place and absorbed the wrath of God for us and paid the price. And then at his resurrection, which chapter 13, verses 20 and 21 mentions, the resurrection of Christ, and his ascension and his session, or his seating at the right hand of God. So that's what he means, having become as much better than the angels. He's talking about his humbling himself and becoming flesh, the incarnation and his life, and his suffering. Uh, the angels, uh, later on it says uh, in chapter 2, um, Angels cannot be saved. This is why demons who used to be angels cannot be saved because the Son did not become an angel. The Son became a human. Uh, in chapter 2, verse, beginning in verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels. Me means he does not, the, the demons, the fallen angels cannot be saved because Christ did not become an angel, but he became a human. But he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. All those who have the faith like the faith of Abraham and people from all the nations, Galatians tells us, who are coming uh, in repentance and faith in Christ are children of Abraham. So those are the five points. Number one, God has spoken. Number two, the Son is the final revelation. Number three, the Son is the final sacrifice. Number four, the Son is fully God. And number five, the Son has become better than the angels implying about his incarnation and suffering. The book of Hebrews as a whole is about how the Son is better. The Son, Jesus Christ, is better than the prophets, he says here. The Son is better than the angels, chapter 2, chapter 1 and 2. The Son is better than Moses, chapter 3. The Son is better than Joshua, chapter 4. The Son is a better high priest than all the Levitical priests, chapters 5 and 7. And the Son has a better covenant, the new covenant in His blood, chapter 8. The Son is a better and final sacrifice, chapters 9 and 10. That's an overview of the book of Hebrews. And then uh, the book of Hebrews is um, challenging because of the warning passages. The warning passages that many people struggle with on interpreting uh, in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 6, chapter 10, and chapter 12. There are five major warnings. And basically, the book of Hebrews is also a book of exhortation or encouragement. If you look at the end in chapter 13, verse 22, he says, bear with uh, this word of encouragement, chapter 13, verse 22. But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word or this message of in exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. So he knows this is a writing, and he says it's a word of encouragement or exhortation. And all through the book, he's saying, let us Go on to maturity. Let us persevere. Let us hold on to our original confession. Let us hold fast to what we said we believe. And the audience of the people that he's writing to are basically three different kinds of people. These are, one group is Jewish Christians who are convinced Jesus is the Messiah. Another group is Jewish Christians people who are not yet convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and they are tempted to go back to the old sacrifices in the temple. 
This book was written before 70 A.D. In 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed. And if, the, if this book had been written after 70 A.D., he surely would have used that in his apologetic and his argument for Christ as the final sacrifice. And also, he uses the present tense for the priests who are still offering the lambs and the sheep and the goats and the bulls in the temple, and in the, he talks about the tabernacle a lot, back, he, alluding back to the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Um, so the warnings, and also there are people, the third group, so the first group are be, true believers. The second group are those Jewish folks who ha, are not yet convinced, and they're tempted to go back to the Old Testament sacrifices. The third group are those that say they're believers, but they're really not. And all through history, we always have people like that. Um, and many people realize later that they're not truly converted, and then God converts them. Um, because it's very easy to do external behavior and just act the part. And this is the, one of the biggest challenges with ministry in all ministry, but especially ministry to these former Muslims who want to get away from their country and the harshness of Islam, uh, many uh, look around and they say the words, uh, but realize that they're not true believers. And so <clears throat> the warnings, the famous, there's a famous warning in chapter 6 and a famous warning in chapter 10, but there, there's other if there's five warnings, um, the warnings are there to cause the true believers to keep going and persevere. They are means or tools or methods by which the elect persevere to the end. When I say the elect, I mean the true believers. Uh, the Bible speaks about uh, eternal election in Ephesians chapter 1 and Romans chapters 8 and 9 and other places. Uh, so these warnings help encourage the true believers to persevere and to grow in holiness and to keep going. They also are warnings to those who think they're believers and they might not be to examine yourselves like the Apostle Paul says in chapter 13 verse 1 Corinthians I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. He says, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. And the warnings also are there to help people who, uh, to convince these Jews who were tempted to go back to the Old Testament sacrifices and the temple services and that system, the warnings are there to warn them that if they do that, there's no more sacrifice and they're still under the wrath of God. The author of Hebrews, nobody knows for sure. Um, the best two suggestions out of many, in my opinion, are either Barnabas, who was a fellow traveler with the Apostle Paul, or it was a sermon preached by the Apostle Paul and translated by Luke. Because the Greek is so high, it's high-level Greek, similar to the Gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts. Those are the, these are the three books of New Testament Koine Greek that are higher level Greek. Um, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion and others have this, I think Barnabas probably wrote this because Barnabas, if you look at Acts 4.36, they call him the son of encouragement. He was an encourager, an exhorter. To, he, he found Saul, who was later called Paul, and he brought him to the apostles. He encouraged Saul. They were afraid of him as he was a former murderer and he persecuted the church. And Barnabas was a great encourager. And the whole book is constantly saying, encourage one another, especially chapter 3, encourage one another day after day, verse 13, and then Chapter 10, he says, encourage one another uh, every day. Uh, don't forsake uh, the assembling of yourselves together. Don't stop going to church and meeting together and worshiping and gathering together for prayer and the Lord's Supper and teaching and preaching. Church 
uh, it's, a, it's a book of encouragement. And he hints at that at the end when he says, bear with this word of encouragement. He's hinting at who he is. And he's a Levite also, Acts 3, uh, 36, or no, Acts 4, 30, Acts 4, 36. It says, Barnabas is the son of encouragement. His name was Joseph. The son of, they called him the son of encouragement. And he's a Levite. And because the book of Hebrews has all those details about the book of Leviticus and the sacrifices. Another positive point for Barnabas is that uh, he is called an apostle. If you look back at Acts 14, uh, the early church recognized the books that were apostolic. And Acts 14.14 calls Paul and Barnabas apostles. Also, verse 4, but you have to read a lot of the context to see it. So Acts 14, 4, and then we'll read verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are men of the same nature as you. They were, they were thinking they were Zeus and Hermes. <laughs> so uh, Paul, uh, Barnabas is called an apostle. And that's the reason why the book of Hebrews is part of the New Testament is because of the content, the apostolic content and doctrine. Uh, and then uh, in two, around 200 A.D., an early church writer named Tertullian, many of you maybe have heard of him. He's very famous for writing in Latin and writing the uh, one substance of God in three persons. One substance in three persons. And Trinitas Unitas is the Latin form where we get Trinity in unity. Uh, Tertullian was, he's the second writer more famous than another guy that said it a little bit earlier than him. Tertullian is known as the father of Latin theology. And when he wrote that, he was explaining. Uh, he used the word Trinity or Trinitas Unitas. And in fact, uh, they, it, it was two words. It was three in one. Trinitas Unitas. Uno, uno, unity. Uh, it wasn't just Trinitas by itself, three. And so he's a very famous, uh, important early church writer. Tertullian said it was Barnabas. Uh, and then also, it makes sense that the writer does not say who he is. If it was the Apostle Paul, in my opinion, Paul would have said, I, Paul, the Apostle, because he's writing at the end. He says, bear with this writing that we read. It makes sense that Barnabas is the author because he doesn't want, because he and Paul had a disagreement later uh, in the book of Acts in chapter, at the end of 15, they departed they disagreed with each other on John Mark. But later, the Apostle Paul says, uh, he gives encouraging words about John Mark at, at the end of the book of Colossians. And he says, uh, bring John Mark to me. He is the cousin of Barnabas. So Barnabas is, wrote this around 68 A.D., before 70 A.D., before the temple was destroyed. It could have been earlier. It could have been 66 A.D. And uh, Barnabas is deliberately not wanting to focus on him as a person in order to focus on the content and the doctrine uh, in the book of Hebrews. So that makes sense to me. But it could be uh, Luke who has translated a sermon of the Apostle Paul. Martin Luther thought it was Apollos because Apollos... Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, I think it's chapter 18, it says he was very eloquent in Greek and he was a Hellenistic Jew. Uh, and uh, Luther and some others think it might have been Apollos. Uh, there are others, but those are the three main ones uh, that we think. But another writer in around 250, his name was Origen, he said, as to who wrote it, God knows. So... We can't be dogmatic about that. But I think the, uh, the case for Barnabas being the writer is very strong, uh, especially since he is called an apostle and he's the son of encouragement. So he wants us to focus on the doctrine and the content. Um, 
So yes, let's go back now uh, to God has spoken. Uh, element number one of this passage. In the past, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, God has spoken. Whenever we struggle with, like we look at the world today and all of the turmoil, uh, the wars, uh, one of the things that I noticed, Connie and I noticed when we watched the international English news in six different cities when we were in the hotel, the news was completely different than American news. The news focused on two things, the English news. It focused on, and they called it the genocide against the Palestinians. Every time they mentioned that and they focused on it, they, it was the main thing they were talking about. They called it the genocide against the Palestinians that Israel was doing. And then the other thing was about climate change and global warming. Everything was about those two things. And they were talking about all these different uh, ways uh, to help uh, save the planet. Those were the two things. And um, when we look at the turmoil in the world, the war in Russia against Ukraine, uh, the, the evil and injustices of that, our political situation, which is very volatile this year, and then the cultural upheaval in the last few years of same-sex marriage and how businesses, uh, massive media companies, Google and YouTube and corporations and banks uh, and government, leftist liberal government uh, and businesses how they are promoting homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and transgenderism. Uh, and it's amazing that some doctors are agreeing with that, and pharmaceutical companies. And when we see all this stuff, we kind of want to throw our hands up and go, Lord, where are you? What are you doing? And a lot of times we say, why don't you speak like you did to Moses and to Abraham? I want to hear your voice. A lot of times we're tempted to think that. I want to encourage you to go back to this and realize God has already spoken. And the message is to go back and focus on Christ and who He is that God has spoken in the Old Testament. He has prophesied about the Messiah to come and all of that, the prophecies. And He has spoken in the New Testament through His Son. Every document of the 27 books the reason why they're in what we call the canon, the, the word canon originally meant a measuring rod, a reed. And it, was, it came to mean criterion or standard or law or rule. And in fact, uh, the Hebrew word, we have the relation of that word from Arabic into Farsi, the language that we learned. We learned Farsi, the language of Iran, but we've never been to Iran. Uh, and we've been ministering among Iranians for over 30 years. And uh, we have this word, qanun, which is related to this word, the original, similar to the Hebrew word for rule or criterion or standard. And that's what it meant originally. And then later it came to mean the list of the books that belong in the Bible. Because you need to realize... Every time the word book is used in the New Testament and the Old Testament, they did not have one of these. They did not have a book like we have with a binding. There was no such thing yet. This only came about later in the late 2nd and 3rd centuries A.D. And they would tie it together with string. So all the, every time you see the word book, it's actually scroll. Every New Testament book and the Old Testament, the Jews speak of the scrolls. The Minor Prophets was one scroll because they're short. It's called the Scroll of the Twelve. And when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were all rolled up scrolls. All the New Testament books, when they were originally written, was an individual scroll. So Matthew, Romans, Hebrews, 1 Timothy, they were rolled up scrolls probably with a seal on them in wax and sent to a specific place. 
So that took time for all the churches in the second and third and fourth century to get all of them under one book cover. They didn't even have what we call a book in the first and second and, it, and third century. And even then, it was the Christians who started putting together books together. So one church would have Romans and Mark together. Another church would have Matthew and uh, some of Paul's epistles. It took time because the church was pretty much persecuted and communication and travel was difficult in those days. So the Son is the final revelation. And I listened to John Piper's sermon on this about God has spoken, and he said, it was a big rebuke to me whenever I'm struggling with why don't you speak anymore like the way you did in the Old Testament. He says, God has spoken. And we are to realize God has spoken clearly in the text. And we are to focus on the text of the Bible, the text of the Scriptures. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit illumines. Uh, I appreciate the pastor when he prayed, he talked about the illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the Word and illumines our heart. I was teaching these Iranians about the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. But the Holy Spirit won't use His sword unless you study and read and meditate and know the Word. And when Jesus said, if you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples. There are seven activities within abiding in the Word of Christ and the Word of God. Number one is hearing the Word, which you're doing today. Number two is reading the Word. Number three is studying the Word. Number four is meditating on the Word. And when you meditate on the Word, you will find you're coming to memorize some of it. Number five, memorization. Number six, obey the Word. Number seven, share the Word with others. Share the Word with each other, believers in the church, in the Bible studies, and share with unbelievers in evangelism. Those are seven activities and all of them are within that understanding of abide in my word god has spoken god has spoken clearly number two the son is the final revelation i've already kind of said that about the new testament remember when jesus was on trial in mark chapter 14 verses 60 to 64 the high priest and the Pharisees and the, uh, the scribes were putting him on trial and they said, tell us clearly, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? The Jews knew the Messiah would be the Son. And that comes from Psalm 2. I'd encourage you to study Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 verse 1, which is what the, the book of Hebrews focuses on. The back, a lot of the background besides the book of Leviticus is Psalm 2. And Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110, verse 1, it says, The Lord says, Yahweh says to my Lord, Adonai, he uses two Hebrew words, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool for my feet. And Jesus quoted that to the Pharisees, to the high priest, and they said he's blaspheming. He quoted from Daniel chapter 7 also. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Sit at my right hand until I make all my enemies a footstool for my feet. The Son is the final revelation. Everything here in the New Testament points back to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Thirdly, the Son is the final sacrifice when He had made purification of sins. When you're going through a hard time, realize God has spoken get back into the Word, and also realize Christ's final sacrifice once for all. That's repeated several times in chapters 7 and 9 and 10. Look at chapter 10 uh, of Hebrews. These are some of the main verses as far as the content of the sacrifice. Hebrews 10.10 10, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
He's the final sacrifice once for all. He paid the price. Our sins have been purified, cleansed. We're forgiven if you're in Christ. And he says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And many verses say Jesus' work at the right hand of the Father is he is praying for you. If you're a believer, he is interceding for you. In Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34, he says, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Yea, Christ Jesus, who died, who rose again, who ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and He is interceding for us. Go back and realize that truth. And that every time we sin, even after we're believers, we, if you're a true believer, you want to confess your sin to the Lord. And if you've hurt somebody or if you have a strained relationship, you want to work on reconciliation with them. And the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. 1 John chapter 1. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is to show the finished nature of the atonement of Christ. Alluding to and quoting Psalm 110, verse 1. The most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament is Psalm 110, 1. And the most alluded to, meaning hinted at, uh, Yes. In chapter 8, verse 1, he's saying, so far, the main point I've been making, Hebrews 8, verse 1, now the main point that we have been saying is this, we have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Christ, the Son, is the final sacrifice. Remember, he said, it is finished on the cross. And the book of Hebrews explains this. The fourth point, the Son is fully God, and I've run out of time. I just want you to notice four phrases that point to the deity of Christ here in verses 2 and 3. He says, the Son through whom He made the world. So he says the Son is the Creator. And other verses say that too in the New Testament. Number two, He is the radiance of His glory. What an amazing phrase that the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus the Son, is the radiance of the Father's glory. Remember when Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, you cannot see my face and live. If God showed His full glory to human beings, we would die. We would melt like I remember as a kid, I would take salt and pour it on a slug and it would... The nature of the salt zapped the nature of the slug. That's how holy God is. And He says Jesus is the shining light, the radiance of the glory of God. And He said to the disciples in John 14, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Many people say, I don't have a problem with Jesus. I have a problem with the Father because He was so mean in the Old Testament. I have a problem with Yahweh. Many people have said this to Me. And I said, but Jesus said, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. I have the same character and the same nature. He's the radiance of the Father's glory. And He's the exact representation of His nature. He's talking about the deity of Christ. And then He says He upholds all things by the word of His power. There's Only God can be described as the one who is holding everything. He's holding all the atoms together of the wood and the steel and the plastic and the trees and the oxygen and the atmosphere of this world. These are four major phrases that say Jesus the Son is fully God. And then the Son has become better than the angels. Point number five. Element number five. I've already talked about this. The key there is Hebrews 2.9. For a little while, He was made lower than the angels. And later in chapter 2, He will go over much of the issue of the humanity of Christ, the incarnation, 
the suffering. And he says, through sufferings, he was made perfect. He's the perfect God-man. He's the perfect human and the perfect God-man. One person with two natures. And when he, ra- when he was raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, he, he, he got his original, uh, his original position again. Jesus prayed in John 17.5. He said, Father, glorify me with the same glory that I had with you before the world was. So he, when he says he's become better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they, he's talking about his humility, his incarnation, his suffering. He entered into all your sufferings, all your burdens. And later on, it will in chapter 4, he says he can sympathize with us in chapter 4. Um, Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. So there we have it. There's the first four verses of Hebrews. And because of your prayers and gifts, I'm able to teach verse by verse of many books uh, to these former Muslims who are now Christians. And the Spirit of God is working Uh, to cause them, the believers, to persevere. And also, the Spirit of God is working among unbelievers because we always have unbelievers in the meetings. So when you're tempted to think about the troubles of the world and, God, why don't you speak anymore? Remember, God has finally spoken in the Scriptures. And go back and slowly meditate upon the Scriptures and study them. Spend time worshiping God in prayer by using these verses about Christ, the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of His nature. He upholds the world by His power. He created the world. Use these Scripture verses in your prayer and your worship. Praise God for His final sacrifice that He made purification of sins, forgiveness, salvation. The wrath of God and justice of God was satisfied. Spend time praising God for that. And praise Jesus the Son that He is seated at the right hand of God and He is interceding for you if you're a believer. Um, If you're not a believer, I would encourage you to continue to study the Word, to read the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John. Read it all the way through and ask God to reveal Himself. I'll never forget... Uh, there was a Turkish tour guide who led a, who was a believer, and we asked him how he came to know Christ. And he said to us, I was against Christianity, and I went to a Christian bookstore, which is not really known much in Turkey, but it's only the minority Christians, which are less than 1%, know about these Christian bookstores because they are the Armenian people. They're an ethnic minority group in Turkey. He went there and he started arguing with the guy. And the guy just asked him, this Christian Armenian guy, asked him one question. He said, have you ever read the New Testament? And it bothered this guy so much because he went home and he went, Whoa. and it kept bugging him and bugging him. He's right, I never read it. Ah. So he went and got a New Testament in Turkish and he read it. And at the end of reading and struggling and And he prayed to Allah and he said, Allah, oh God, which one is true? And he said, I heard this impression in in my mind and heart. Which one has the fruit? And he said, the New Testament has the fruit. So he became a believer in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we've had. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you for their love and support and encouragement to us as missionaries. Thank you for their prayers, Lord, and we pray that your spirit will work. In Jesus' name, amen.